Welcome to Pacific Mammal Research's Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Welcome to the Pac-Man Podcast. I'm Cindy. And I'm Kat. And this week is a marine mammal highlight. And we have, we brought back two. Uh, we just recently had done the Waddell seal uh, that lost. Uh, and then we had a while ago done walrus. We, we did, a, a, during the extremist episode, we did a little bit about the yes. walrus. Um, yes. Because they're pretty extreme. Um, but we pitted them against each other and it was a close one. But the walrus edged out over the Waddell seal once again. <laughs> Poor Waddell seal. <laughs> they are cool, I promise, guys. They are. They're super we'll interesting. <laughs> uh, but the walrus run, um, and actually, I'm uh, pretty excited about it because uh, I, you know, I know a bit about walruses, but not, not a whole lot. Uh, and there was some really interesting stuff about these guys. I mean, they're just so cool looking, anyway. I was gonna say they're just impressive. Yeah. They're just one of those species that's like, all right, I'm gonna take notice of you. <laughs> right? You can't miss them, really. True. Um, between their size and their tusks. Um, so with that, uh, we'll go ahead and get started and Kat will tell us what they look like. Yeah, so let's start off a little bit with where they live, first of all. So predominantly they are found in Arctic waters and specifically areas that are covered with that seasonal sea ice. So we'll get into, I'm sure later in the podcast, why mm -hmm. and how to use this sea ice, but um, that's pretty pivotal to their, their distribution and location. For sure. Um, they do have a discontinuous distribution, meaning that they are found within these Arctic regions, but not continuously across the entire Arctic. So they're kind of found in these little pockets. I was um, to say, like pockets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they have basically, it's, it ends up having a sort of Pacific group, an Atlantic group, and then another group that's kind of in the Northern Asian region um, that are separated from one another. So it's, um, I think they're I think they're actually delineated as three subspecies now. Um, oh, I had, I saw the two. I saw the Atlantic and the Pacific, but I didn't hear, see anything about that third one. So I don't know. Yeah, it's. I think that's or... a newer. Yeah, it's a newer subspecies, and I think it's it's called the Laptev subspecies, oh, and I believe I... that's the specific area that they are mostly found in. I did see that, and one thing, and but I hadn't seen it anywhere else. So I was like, what is mm -hmm. that? <laughs> So yeah, yeah. So I found a couple that said that it was a uh, in proposal for that third subspecies. One that that said it was actually the third subspecies, like that was a legitimate thing. So, um, basically three general groups is what we're talking about. Um, so basically found in northern waters of Canada, Greenland, Norway, and Russia. Um, and in terms of population size, I didn't see any like great estimates but basically we're talking more than about 230,000 walrus we think worldwide obviously as we've talked about before getting population estimates especially in these more far-flung regions is really tricky yeah um which actually I'll I forgot I'll talk about that when you get into the the recent research because I did see something very cool about that oh, which I, you might have maybe also it's the seen. same thing because I have okay we well, might have also seen it. like you can help with it uh, yeah exactly yeah, so yeah, we yeah. probably saw the same yeah. Um, but yeah, so basically around 25,000 plus Atlantic walrus, around about 200,000 Pacific walrus, give or take. I saw a couple lower estimates than that as well, but um, around about that 200,000 and about 5,000 of the Laptev walrus. Interesting. That's such a large difference in population size. And mm -hmm. there is some differences related to Atlantic versus Pacific um, that I'll be talking about a little bit. I'm going to be hanging out more mainly with the Pacific walrus because yeah. that's where we are, but yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. And also appearance wise, they're a little different too. So okay. walrus in general are <laughs> one of the largest pinnipeds. So again, pinnipeds are um, seal, sea lions, walruses, um, and they are the only species in the Odobenidae group. Um, oh, living species. Living species. Yes. Which we'll talk about when we get to the threats a little okay. bit more. Um, well, and, no, you're talking about the size. What's the only animal that's bigger than in the pinnipeds? There's only, well, two, I guess, technically, that are bigger than walruses. Well, stellar sea cow is one that doesn't exist anymore, right? No, nope. Yeah, but the uh, ones that are living. Um, um, let me see. The southern elephant seal. And the northern. Northern elephant seal. Yeah. Yay, the there you go. Good job. <laughs> 
I'm like, wait, now I'm being put on the spot. What, wait a second. <laughs> but you know it. You know it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I can do yeah, it. The elephant seals are the only ones that are bigger. So they're second going to that. Yeah. Yeah. So they do have a very large, strong body with a thick <laughs> hide that can be over an inch thick. And the hide itself is very leathery and kind of wrinkled in appearance. So again, most of you probably have seen pictures of walrus, but they do appear to be almost bald. They actually do have a very sparse covering of like very short, fine fur, but it's, they seem, they look like they're bald, especially because of that wrinkled appearance. Um, and the blubber, blubber, the blubber <laughs> layer, <laughs> that's hard to say. The blubber layer beneath the, the skin itself can be up to six inches thick, which is that's wild. Bonkers. I mean, right. And mostly around the neck like area, super cool. neck yeah, and shoulders. Yeah. Which also makes sense when we get into like the, the male on male action oh, um, yeah. during the breeding season. That's very, <laughs> very essential. Um, interestingly enough, apparently males can also develop nodules, which are called bosses around the neck and shoulders. Well, so bossy. apparently that's a specific male thing. Intriguing. Okay. I think it's um, called bosses. I know. Yeah. It's really intriguing. Um, in terms of their color, they are kind of a mid to light brown. I saw one source that called them cinnamon colored, which I love. I love the cinnamon. Um, and then the younger animals are typically darker. As they get older, they lighten in color. And some of the older males can almost be pink in color. So it seems like they almost lose pigmentation as they get older. Yeah. Doesn't, well, it's um, almost similar to like uh, pink. The pink dolphins are born, mm -hmm. right? And then they turn pink as they get older, right? Correct. So. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's interesting. It's almost an opposite direction mm -hmm. than, than most species go. Yeah. In terms of size, um, like I said, the Pacific walrus is different than the Atlantic. So the Pacific walrus is larger than the Atlantic walrus. Um, males can reach up to two tons, yeah. whereas the Atlantic walrus, they're, they're typically around like 1.3 to 1.6 tons. So they're a little bit less chunky um, with lengths of up to 12 feet. And the females are typically smaller in both subspecies, weighing closer to around that one ton mark with lengths of around eight feet. So mm -hmm. it's still pretty hefty, but, you know... It seems then too that the difference between males and females is greater for Pacific than it is for Atlantic, which is interesting. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and both species do have those very distinctive tusks as well. Yeah. So the tusks are basically enlarged canine teeth um, and they, they continue to grow throughout the lifetime of the animal. So again, they're found in both the males and females, but the male tusks typically are longer and thicker and can reach up to one meter in length, weighing several kilos. Feet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wild. Can you imagine and having that just like sticking out of your mouth? Like, 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 well, you think about the saber toothed tiger. Like, really, does that, like, can, how can you eat? How can you do anything with these giant yep. <laughs> yep. And they do. And that's a good, that's a good point. So, I mean, aside from obviously sexual selection and, and being this sort of characteristic trait, um, they can be used as a defense weapon and an active offense weapon as well yep. um we'll but they are that. yeah the the tusks are also thought to help them create breathing holes in the sea ice and also to help them haul out of the water so literally almost like a like a grabbing device to, to help them pull out of the water onto the sea ice yeah. um but other than the tusks they have relatively few other teeth um yeah, they, we're talking about that with the with the food they like to i sell. was gonna say i figured you would i'm like i'm not gonna go any further i think <laughs> so you'll cool. get it. um Speaking of that too, they do also have hundreds of these short little whiskers on their nose. So it creates that kind of very mustached look, um, which are highly, highly sensitive. And again, I'm sure Cindy will get into that when we talk about foraging. Mm -hmm. um, but fun fact, they can have up to 700 whiskers that reach 100. up to 30, 30 centimeters long, which is about 12 inches. The whiskers so they say long? short whiskers. So short. Yeah. yeah, they say short. Well, I mean, I guess if you if you see it, it's like they're shorter right around the lip area. Oh, and then right. They do, and they get they, longer. They do grow longer so I'm, t I'm assuming they're talking like the longer whiskers and i suppose but relatively yeah. that's shorter than their tusks so <laughs> right and if you're talking on a 12 foot animal 12 it's inches really not that long but i that was staggering to me i didn't realize that's it was quite crazy. that quite yeah that i always long. think about just the ones right next to their mouth and then mm -hmm. right yeah and then um finally just a really random factoid about their appearance they can protrude their eyes so <laughs> basically it means they can like stick their eyeballs out a little bit more in order to see both in front and behind them. Yeah, so they have both frontal and dorsal vision. And that's basically, they have highly developed extraocular muscles, which are the muscles around the eye, and they have no orbital root. So like, basically they can they can roll their eye all the way back and there's no like, there's like no eye socket that, that blocks it. Oh. Isn't that Oh, wild? so they protrude it out and then go back like that and they can see. Behind. Right, and they can what? see like, which I mean, all I can think is that if you are existing in 
sea ice you're constantly looking above you and then you're I, I don't I don't know why they versus other sea ice associated yeah. species would have this ability but isn't that crazy because they don't I mean they don't have, like other seals and sea lions have more predators than walruses do so like so that's what I'm thinking all I can think is that it's something related to being is, in sea ice in that environment I would yeah. guess but I didn't see any any rationale as to why that had evolved but like yeah that's anyway great. so it, as soon as you said that I, ha- I don't you you've probably seen it probably many of our listeners have that there's that one lady that can do that with her eyes and on like yeah no you can look oh, it up like, no i haven't seen it shooting lady i'm sure i don't know if i up. want to i think that might skeeve me out a little bit it, it, it does but she can literally she pushes her eyeballs out of her sockets and like push them out must yeah. have very advanced extraocular muscles apparently <laughs> who knew <laughs> <laughs> but right. anyway, that is all I have for their distribution and their appearance. Okay. Well, they are very cool. They're, I think sometimes it's like kind of like a, a face only a mother could love kind of thing. Like they're not exactly beautiful Aww. animals, but they're cute. But they're, I think they're cute. They are. They are. But then if you if you just looked at their skin, you're like, Whoa, because it's it's kind of it's like crackling. it's like how how little old men are cute. Yes, you know, exactly. it's the same thing where it's like, yeah. oh, you're adorable. <laughs> Just, just, so like, just like that <laughs> exactly <laughs> all right so we'll get into then the diet and behavior and there was uh a, quite a quite a bit um although we don't you know again it's very hard to, to see these guys so <laughs> uh where they live um but we do a fair amount so they are a generalist they can eat over 60 genera of marine organisms so again okay. not species like you're up at the gen, gen, you know the genus, which is a, a wide range. So mainly the bottom dwelling soft invertebrates makes up about ninety seven percent of their diet um, that are either on or below the seafloor, and these include clams, which is really their most favorite food, uh, shrimp, soft corals, which I thought, I've never mm. heard of anything really eating soft corals, yeah. uh, mollusks like snails, octopus, and squid, um, worms like two worms and things like that, uh, sea cucumbers, which sounds disgusting to eat, but I'm sure some people do, uh, and tunicates, which with that one, I'm like, that can't be that much nutrition there. It's not like eating popcorn or something. Right. Maybe that's their snack food. Who knows? Right. Um, and then sometimes slow moving fish, but also there have been a few that um where did i have it on here um but they have seen that some might eat other seals oh wow yeah and not um i think it was mainly males that did that possibly um and but that's not very common at all Hmm. um and now i'm I'm sure i'll find it again in my notes but i can't find it at the moment right now (laughs) if i find it i'll pull it back up um so they how they feed those really interesting um they generally prefer shallow water so they're not really in deep water much at all um, it, um ex- which is interesting compared to many of the pinnipet species that can dive quite deep um one said that the the previous dive record was 102 feet which is not very far at all uh, but then someone documented them at 1640 feet so oh yeah well then <laughs> Uh, I think it's likely like 100, 200 feet or less, most likely, you know, they're close to the coast, um, but it likely depends on both prey distribution and seabed depth. And you know, so they probably can dive deeper if they need to, but it's not very common. Um, so they're generally in those shallow uh, self regions and they, so they don't use the tusks for feeding. Um, and this is interesting because other of the extinct odobenids did use their tusks for feeding, mm. but these guys don't for whatever reason. Interesting. Um, and whatever teeth they have are flat, so they're not really great for anything. <laughs> Just kind of um, crushing, probably. Yeah, I guess. I guess but but so they, they're kind of like uh, uh, narwhals, which have, you know, the just big giant tusks, but no real teeth in their mouth. Yeah. And they use suction. So they have specialized lips and they have a piston tongue that is able to shoot back really quickly and create a vacuum that sucks out the meat to the shells. That's cool. I just like the piston tongue. <laughs> super cool um oh here we go it's right there in front of me most some mostly males will also feed on seals and seabirds oh wow interesting i was like that's why are you eating seabirds okay um they they also had possibly prey on entrapped narwhals or scavenged whale carcasses but there's very little evidence for this so i'm not exactly sure Hmm. why they said it (laughs) there's really no evidence for it but apparently it's a thing that could happen 
Um, mm -hmm. And that's probably those extremes, right? The individual like decides to try to do that because it's an option, but it's not what they really do. Um, so one of the biggest things I, I learned, um, I had always kind of thought that they use the, or had heard that they use the tusks to dig up the sediment and find oh. the food, right? They don't do that. Yeah, I was gonna say, I don't think I'd ever heard that. Yeah, I, for whatever reason, I, I had had that because multiple things said they do not do this. Like, you know, yeah, interesting. trying to make it correct. Um, so they actually use their whiskers. Those very, very, again, are super sensitive, very much like cat whiskers, right? So they're very, very sensitive. Um, and that helps them find their prey on the seafloor. Um, and then what's cool is that they, again, their mouths are super cool. They clear the bottom with jets of water. Um, oh, interesting. And, and active flipper movements. Nice. So, so like. <laughs> right, yeah, they're like blowing away the sand almost. Yeah, exactly. That's cool. Rather than using the giant tusks that they have that they could you know, do that for. So it's, it's uh, I mean, I guess if you don't need to, then you don't need to, but it's interesting. Um, and so there are some ecological benefits to this uh, for the environment because it it disturbs the seafloor, and I love this term, it bioturbates. Mm -hmm. Super mm -hmm. cool. So turbation is, is basically to, you know, mixing things up. And so what that does is it releasing releases nutrients into the water column and encourages mixing and, and movement of different organisms um, and then increases the patchiness of the seafloor, which I thought was interesting that they called that a benefit. So you don't always think of patchiness as a benefit to things, but there must be a reason for it. Yeah, I'm trying to think back to my ecology classes. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I know there is, that sounds familiar, but I'm not I'm not recalling exactly why that's yeah. important. And maybe well. there's delineations between different areas so that, you know, different things can live. I think it's, some, yeah, I think it's something to do with like niche specialization and like actually like distribution of habitat for different species to utilize. Yeah, exactly. Rather than all just being continuous. And I guess if it's patchy too, that would increase biodiversity because it's not all the same. Right, yeah, because one thing would, so. would get out, get out compete everything else and then right one thing. Yeah. yeah so the uh, i th was thinking of them kind of like beavers right they are um ecological engineers mm -hmm. you know um which is very important so another reason to help protect them um so uh behaviorally so because their food is is there they are, they do stay close to shore and i and the uh, um land and ice depending on where they are at because they do use land as well um, but they use the sea ice extensively as a haul out throughout the year. So no matter where they are, they like to use these um, ice flows. Um, for summer, uh, when they're farther north, um, they uh, uh, use them as resting areas be between feeding. So, you know, you got a two ton body, you're flinging around the ocean, you got to get tired, you got to throw yourself back up on the ice for a bit. Um, it also provides shelter from storms and predators. Right? So. Um, not that they have too many killer whales and, and polar bears are really their, their main ones, but they're not, they're not as preyed on as much as other pinnipeds species are, probably because they're so huge. We'll talk about that. <laughs> yes. Um, and so uh, also what's interesting is, and maybe this has something to do with the difference between the sizes of the Atlantic and Pacific, but the loss of sea ice is going faster in the Atlantic than it is in the Pacific. And so I, you know, I don't know how that relates exactly. And we'll talk about in the re new research, how sea ice maybe isn't super strong correlated with, um, with their food and stuff like that. Um, so basically, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the level of sea ice is really important for them, but how it affects their populations may be very varied or, or different than mm. we don't understand. Um, but I thought that was interesting that it's faster in one, one side versus the other. Mm -hmm. Um, they are very social, these walruses. Um, they travel and rest in large groups. So you have the mother calf bond, which is the strongest and the longest among pinnipeds because the, the calves will stay, I'll talk about that in a second, but um, at least two years. Mm -hmm. And um, females become dangerously aggressive to protect their young, which I thought was funny. Like, did you have to put dangerously in front of aggressive? Because I think an aggressive walrus is already pretty dangerous. Uh, I mean, it's different though, right? I mean, yeah. dangerous aggressive means that it has actually likely injured people. True, true. You know, because you can just be aggressive but not actually do anything. Yeah, more threatened versus actually right. Like, no, I'm just gonna take right. It. <laughs> yeah. Um. So if there's no sea ice, then they will rest on rocks and sandy beaches, even grassy hills. I'm just imagining a little walrus hanging out on a right, grassy just hill. reclining Amazing. on a grassy knoll. <laughs> 
Um, and so this allows the opportunity to form these very large call outs. And sometimes you get tens of thousands of individuals, which blows my mind to see me. It's so cool to see that. <laughs> so cool. It's crazy. Um, and so the tusks, as you're talking about, are mainly social um, in use, besides hauling themselves out, you know, with the onto ice lows and stuff like that, or chip the holes, like you said, to get um, breath holes. Uh, but the males are commonly used for sexual display and sparring. So the larger tusks um, animals dominate the social groups and of course the mating opportunities. Um, and what's cool is that they will raise and then turn their heads sideways to display their tusks and they're basically measuring them. So they like- Interesting. Turn each so other. they're literally doing the like, hey, is yours longer than mine? <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Love like, it. Direct comparison. And then the one with the smaller tusks will usually move away. Wow. But if they have similar size, then they may fight and they stab each other inflicting bruises and ruptures. Yeah. And I mean, if you've ever seen like Frozen Planet or any of the, um, you know, those kind of nature documentaries where they, they show some of the sparring, it's pretty intense. Like they can really, really like fatally damage one another during these fighting. fighting well, you matches. have like a three foot long tusk and get granted your height is an inch and then maybe six inches of blubber, but that she goes any farther I mean still yeah I mean you still have two tons of weight behind it though right. stabbing through that so I mean exactly. it's pretty so I thought it was very interesting that they have that visual inspection and then mm -hmm. it's like oh yeah okay yeah no you're bigger okay thanks so. yeah that's really interesting <laughs> um and then females uh are will also be aggressive in that they will threaten and jab each other for better position on the hollow outs right so they have a better mm -hmm. position for female for their babies and everything so it's cool um and then the defensive, they fought off rare attacks from polar bears or killer whales, which or other walruses, um, which I'm sure Kat will get into later with the threats. Um, so interesting for their migration, they actually they winter in, and again, this is the Pacific. I'm only I'm only talking about the Pacific here. Um, they winter in the Bering Sea Sea pack ice, and then they separate in the spring. So they're going up in the summer to go to higher latitudes, like many other cetaceans and mammals we've talked about. Um, and so in the spring, the females with young migrate to the Chichki um, no, uh, up north, um, often passively moving with the receding ice. So it was like, do, 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 as the ice goes away. Um, most adult males actually migrate to Bristol Bay, where they rest on land hollows between foraging belts. So it's, uh, it's interesting that there's a sexual difference between the migration. Mm -hmm. um, so guy, the, the boys are hanging out in Bristol Bay. The girls and some of the other males have gone up to the north to, to feed. And then during late fall, they begin their return from the Chichki to the Bering um, ahead of that advancing sea ice, right? It starts to close up, so they start heading back down. And then the males in Bristol Bay actually go north to meet, re meet that returning population and then all head back together. How interesting. So I wonder, is that related to food cycles then? I, I would assume, I would assume that maybe um, the males that aren't, um, well, and they mate. You know, if they if they're if they're not they don't need to be around females for any reason or whatever, they're just they get more food down in Bristol Bay, yeah. I guess. And interesting. Or they segregate it that way. That way the females can get what they need and the males get what they need. Right. Yeah, but they didn't elaborate on that. Or, hmm. Yeah. That was interesting. And there, there yeah. are cases in other animals where the males and females do different things. Um, mm -hmm. but that's apparently what they do. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so for reproduction, now that we they've all congregated back together <laughs> in the winter. Um, the females are sexually mature around six to seven, um, and they give birth every two years. This is the lowest reproductive rate of any kind of head. Um, and ovulation is suppressed until the cap is weaned, so they don't, yeah, there's no crossover. Um, what's really interesting is that males, uh, females are diestrous, so they actually go into heat in late summer and in February, mm -hmm. but only the males are fertile around February. So what's the point? So wait, so the males are not fertile all the time? No. Well, so that's they said that oh, they're only fertile in February, but I don't know if that just means they 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 only have the babies in February or they only mate in February. But they specifically said males are only fertile around February, but I don't know what because in are. most species males right, are fertile yes, always. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I'm like, wait a minute, what? Is this one species where the males are not fertile all the time? Yeah, I don't know what that terminology um, interesting. I, didn't really realize it until right now when I was reading it, like, oh, wait a minute, what exactly does that mean? <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it, if nothing else, it just means they, they, they don't have, even if they made it in late summer, they don't. 
Well, I actually think that they don't meet in the summer. They only meet in February. So they, there's only, there is a one time that they meet and have babies. But for some reason, the females are also in heat in late summer. Hmm. But maybe, maybe it's that they're, either the males aren't fertile or their their behavior doesn't match up, right? So they're not going to try mating at that time. Right. But then and why I, have why have the other Well, I'm just thinking, I mean, late fall is usually when they're all coming back together, right? So maybe there's some sort of like social cue that's that's initiated by the females coming back into heat, even though they're not mating, perhaps there's mm-hmm. like a social social cue to like, hey, now it's time to congregate. Maybe it's um, a, a tell that like, hey, I'm going to be ready in February. Right, or... exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? That's yeah. really interesting. Um, the males are sexually mature at eight to 10 years, but as the case with many things, they usually cannot successfully compete against the older ones until they are about 15. So again, if your tusks yeah. aren't as big as my tusks, you're not going to make it. Yep. <laughs> um, so these guys mate in the water, unlike a lot of the other seals um, and sea lions that we talk about that usually mate on land um, in January to March, uh, and then it peaks in February. So that's that. that meantime um and like other pinnipeds they have that three to four month delayed implantation so it just go, the fertilized egg goes on hiatus for a little bit um and then uh implants so that, that she can have the baby um the next year so it's a total gestation of about 15 months and that is the longest of all pinnipeds which yeah. again goes to uh, long time frames um so the males will aggregate in the water around these uh, ice bound groups of females and engage in competitive vocal displays um, of clicking and bell-like sounds. That's all that I could find on it. But I think it's funny that these giant walruses are like, ding! I was going to say, you're just like, oh, check out my sensitive side. As right? I make my little bell-like sounds while displaying my tusks. Right. <laughs> like, like, it's a big, big giant, like, two-ton walrus, like, holding this little triangle. Ding! Right? Ding. So wonderful. So cute. Um, and then I guess the females go, hey, that was super sexy and uh, join them in the water and then copulate. So um, they give birth on the sea ice in late spring, which is April to June. Um, and then calves stay with mom uh, for uh, it, for at least two years, uh, usually. And they can swim at birth, which is important if you're on a nice mm-hmm. boat. Um, they nurse for over a year and then wean. Um, and they have the milk fat and protein levels are higher compared to land animals but lower than other phocid seals like interesting again that that because they have long lactation they have longer time yeah yeah Yeah. less pressure Um, and they did note that calves can stay with a mom up to five years wow so yeah so that so it goes to your when we talk about uh, population and threats and stuff like that these guys will take longer to come back from any kind of issues because they have this longer gestation and longer um nursing and um um how long they have calves, how easily, how quickly they have calves. Um, so that's what I have for behavior. Um, I think we will take a quick break and then come back with our, our threats and status and then some cool new research that we're going to talk about. So we will be right back. All right, we are back. So Kat, let's tell tell us about what what's what's going on with these guys. Yeah, good question. So like I mentioned at the beginning, this is the only extant species in the Odobenidae family. Um extant and living. Correct. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um so basically these guys are currently listed by the IUCN as vulnerable. Um however, because they now have these different subspecies, there has been um some effort to try to have different listings for the different subspecies based on their potential vulnerability. Um, So I know, for example, the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has proposed that the Pacific walrus should be listed as threatened. Um, Unfortunately, that has not been passed at this point, because some of this gets a little political, right, where there's higher priority species that need that listing in order to be conserved, like desperately. So there's kind of this almost triaging of who gets to have this term because that that confers a certain level of effort that needs to then be put towards it and that has to go towards the most 
um, well, the most the threatened problem, species. Yeah, the problem is you can't have like if the population level is at this, this means threatened or species extinct. You know, uh, yeah, endangered. Right. It, it varies depending on the population you're talking about. So how do you right. figure that out? If you get the right, and that is exactly that's kind of the tricky part with trying to make these very wide, you know, wide sweeping. Mm -hmm generalized terms um that certain populations may be more at risk than others so well i mean you have two hundred thousand on the pacific and what you said like twenty five thousand on the atlantic but that seems to be like oh well, definitely the atlantic needs it but that may be the carrying capacity of the atlantic right so it right you know you can't compare it's apples and oranges yeah exactly so it's kind of tricky but basically right now and i believe the lapdev walrus they're actually it's it's kind of a data deficient one at this point because it's a relatively new subspecies mm -hmm. um, listing they are more closely related to the pacific walrus so i think that's why there's been some back and forth of whether or not they should be a subspecies or should just be considered part of the pacific are, walrus they, are they distinct enough from them exactly exactly yeah so all of them are protected under the marine mammal protection act but as i said basically right now general listing by the IUCN is is vulnerable um and so I just as it should the, be with climate change I well exactly <laughs> I was gonna say, getting into the threat yeah. but I mean just just one quick note because I did think this was really interesting that the Pacific walrus specifically um they did note that their population has varied pretty substantially in the last 150 years so it's again it's one of those cases where you know, they had a little bit of an increase between 19, 1960 to 1980 and actually may have even reached carrying capacity um, after having had like a pretty steady decline in the 20th century, which I'll get into why in a second. Um, but it, now the current trend is unknown, right? Because we, we don't have that consistent data. So it's, these populations do go through fluctuations, but like Cindy said earlier, when you have that longer reproductive cycle, it does take quite a bit longer for them to bounce back from any kind of decline that may hit the population. So just an interesting one to note that they they do have that kind of um, knowledge that this, at least the Pacific population has gone through a few of these ups and downs in the well, past. And I'm sure that, have, I mean, there is variation in climate each year and between decades, just with how much sea ice there is, regardless of anthropogenic influence at this point, you know, exactly. so those will influence how, you know, their ecology and feeding and all that kind of stuff. So that makes right. sense that there'd be that variation there. Right, exactly. So getting into threats, <laughs> obviously we've mentioned this a few times now, but climate change is the the number That's one number threat, one for which, them. Just, I mean, never. right? Any any of the ice related species that we're talking about, basically climate change is going to be the number one potential threat. So now that Cindy's gone through some of the ways that these guys utilize sea ice, obviously you can kind of see like any sort of reduction or thinning of the sea ice even is going to be of huge concern for walrus populations. Um, and again, you know, significantly going to affect their feeding, their mating, their resting, um, their ability to pup successfully um, or calve successfully. Um, they have less time on shore, which limits their ability to forage and or pushes them more towards the land-based haulouts, which is dangerous for many reasons. Um, predation obviously is one of the main ones that they are, especially the younger walrus, are at much higher risk of predation by polar bears and just regular bears yeah. or even like foxes, like Arctic foxes and stuff like that will take young, young um, walrus when they're on shore versus out in a, in a patch of sea ice. Oh, yeah. um, and interestingly enough, it's also dangerous for the younger animals because larger animals will crush them uh, on their way to the, to the water. Or if there's, if there's a predator, stampede. they get stampeded and, and crushed to death. So it's, yeah. that one hadn't really occurred to me. And I was like, oh, geez, that's a little bit yeah, I didn't but, either. And there's a there's a thing about uh, in the new research one where it talk, I'll I'll talk about that a bit. But yeah, like stampeding is a problem. <laughs> you have a two ton yeah. animal. I mean, we talked about that with elephant seals too. Like some of the cats, some of the baby, you know, pups, you know, do get crushed because the animal's that big. But you have again, go back to we talked about tens of thousands of animals that are hauled out. Yeah, like yeah, you just stampede and they're that, all running like, away from you're something. Have a high I mean, calf mortality. Yeah, exactly. So that's the other thing. It's it's very different when you're on these land-based haulouts um, versus being on a patch of sea ice where you can slip into the water to get away. So multiple reasons why climate change is not great for these guys. Um, speaking of predation, like we already mentioned, killer whales and polar bears are really the main two natural predators of uh, walruses. Um, again, like I said, one of the bigger things with climate change too is that the polar bear behavior is changing significantly as well. And they are also struggling to find food. So they are also foraging further afield. So just that interplay of, you know, walrus is potentially having to haul out on land more. Um, the polar bear is already being quite starved. 
and or the polar bear is venturing further afield to find prey um, that's going to drive a little bit potentially has has the op option to drive higher predation on walrus by you're pushing bears. you're pushing two different species together things are going to happen yeah exactly um, aside from predation, active hunting of walruses is one of the major threats. Um, so they have been a source of both food and resources for indigenous peoples for, I mean, hundreds of years. Yeah. And they are still a really important part of the diet of um, people who live in the Arctic today. So typically walruses were used for their meat, um, number one, uh, but also their hide and their tusks. So the hide was used to make things like footwear or even some really strong rope. I guess there's a traditional mm -hmm. method of twisting the, the the hide together to make like a, for use a harpoon or a spear yeah. that you're trying to then retrieve. That um, makes sense. Very strong. I mean, it's really strong hide, so. Mm -hmm. Yep. And their tusks, they were used to either trade or barter them um, or to make jewelry or carvings. And this can actually, even now, can be a really important source of income mm -hmm. um, for some some tribal tribal groups. Yeah, it's like, um, it's, ivory, it's ivory, it's like tusks for elements. Yeah, it's the same, same. yeah exactly. Um, so the meat is especially important, obviously, in these Arctic climates where you are basically going to run out of food in the winter. <laughs> um, <laughs> And especially for the walrus, because they had this larger group of animals available to them during the summer and fall. So they could actually like mm -hmm. basically kill a bunch of animals up front, use some of it fresh. But then they also had special ways of preserving the meat. Um, and I guess it would actually last quite, it was one of the meats that would last quite well if preserved correctly um, for use throughout the winter months. And apparently, I don't, I'm not even going to try to say the name of, of the specific type, but it basically there's a, there's a method of preservation of walrus meat that is highly prized as a delicacy and is often used in um, ceremonial and celebratory meals um, mm -hmm. by the Inuit people. So obviously overhunting of walrus was the main reason for their decline that occurred in the 20th century. There was a huge, huge market for ivory at that point. The, the big game hunting was massive at that point, just beyond any sort of indigenous use. Um, and of course, where there is trade, where there is opportunity for, um, for income, more were killed um right. so that was that was really the major major many, decline many. that occurred mm -hmm. yeah like many other yeah. large or big game species yep mm -hmm. um so i mean obviously this does still go on today um it is more typically more regulated and there are certain areas where you are legally not allowed to do it except for in certain seasons and you have to basically prove that you are doing doing it for cultural reasons right um mm -hmm. yeah and then lastly, we have just, right, you know, kind of more generic human disturbance. So they are quite sensitive to disturbances. So things like boats or even low flying, like the low oh, flying my. planes, <laughs> tripping over my words, um, can cause the animals to flush into the water. So again, like we talked about with that stampeding, if they're on land, yeah. uh, you know, disturbances can cause that to happen. And obviously, just as the sea ice breaks up more, um, you know, we've talked about this in previous podcasts, there's going to be increased vessel movement in the Arctic. And just therefore increasing the likelihood that these animals are going to be disturbed either directly or, you know, disturbance through things like pollution or oil spills or anything like that, um, that may displace the animals and or, you know, potentially over longer term cause major well, problems. The energy expenditure, right? Mm -hmm. So now you're yeah. swimming more. It's the same thing with the polar bears, right? They're swimming yeah. now more because they're in between ice patches and you just use more energy than you're getting when you feed. So. Yeah, and that's the thing. If you're being disturbed from your feeding right. every time you try to go feeding, or resting, buzzing by in a boat, or resting, exactly, mm -hmm. it it really just lowers the threshold that they can handle. Well, and then too, um, if you're flushing when you don't need to, then you don't flush when you do need to because you're too tired, and then you get eaten. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. So. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so that was all that I had for threats. Do we want to do? Do we want to leave fun facts to the end? Should we do the new yeah, research first and then do some, some fun facts at the end? Okay, and there's cool. some interesting research stuff. Um, so what I found even more interesting is that there wasn't, at least that I could find, again, I, I don't do like a crazy extensive search here, but um, there weren't that many like newer articles. Most of the articles I have here are from like 2010s maybe, which mm. doesn't seem that long, but then you think about it, it's like, well, that's 12 years ago. <laughs> that's, the 80s were not 40 years ago, oh my God. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I thought that was interesting. And most of it are about these historical perspectives in relation to the harvest that were done and sea ice change and trying to see how those changes will then affect what's happening now right mm -hmm. so there isn't there wasn't a lot like about like we're doing this really cool study on vocalizations or like even hey let's go out and count all these animals <laughs> yeah. but speaking of counting this is one i think that you probably found i think we probably yeah i think it's the same one walrus from space yeah 
Yes. So uh, cool. and, this, and I'll I'll put the link to this one in the show notes because it was really cool. And so this is like again we talked before on another podcast about citizen science, um, and basically they have all of these. Um, they need people to be walrus detectives, and they have all these pictures from satellites of the of the Arctic regions and um, these satellite images. <clears throat> they need people to look at them and see if you can see walruses. Um, it's just it's a it's a massive thing that you know one two people are going through. It's going to take them forever. But if everybody can just take a look at these and say, oh, I see five or I see 20 or a thousand uh, and put them in and then they can understand more about when and where these animals are hauling out and what they're doing. Um, so they said even, um, let's see, are asking the public to be, as WWF and the British Antarctic um, Survey are asking the public to become walrus detectives and help contribute to conservation science by spending as little as 30 minutes searching for walrus in thousands of satellite images taken from space. Um, and that's for the Atlantic walrus specifically gotcha so if you i want to do it i know right i, I totally i was like oh i guess spend 30 minutes looking for walruses <laughs> that sounds fun um so if you want to help out with walruses that's the way you can directly do it and contribute to research so that was super cool um so then that one of the more recent ones was from 2018 and this was looking at archaeological historic and modern pacific diet across 4,000 years um wow. to look at changing sea ice conditions and how that affects their feeding um, again, this is using stable isotopes, so I'm not going to go into detail about that. You can just listen to our last podcast that we just talked about, stable isotopes, um, about that. But it's basically looking at molecular data to determine um, what the animals are eating. Uh, and so this was interesting in that they, they looked at high versus low sea ice times. They compared to see what the animals were eating during those times. Um, and um, the in archaeological times, the levels were similar for, with high versus low years. So it didn't seem hmm. that there was really that much of a difference, but there was more variation at the low years. So this may mean that there's a decrease of preferred prey. So they're still doing okay and they're eating other things, but not as much as what they usually eat. Right. So um, again, one of the pros of being a more generalist predator. Exactly. Right. You have yeah. other options. Mm -hmm. um, but what's really interesting is that I think this is counterintuitive if we talked about, you know, we talked about how much the sea ice is important to them. Overall sea ice conditions were not a primary driver of changes in walrus diet over 4,000 years. Hmm. Um, and they did show that the diet of the modern walrus was different than that of the archeological low sea ice intervals. So their diet now is, is not related to low sea ice, right? If they were, if it was the same as the archeological low sea ice, then we know, oh, okay, they're changing their diet because of the sea ice. Um, and so what they think is the changes that are currently underway are unlike any others that have occurred during the last 4,000 years. So we Which makes sense. I mean, just what's occurring to our planet right now has not occurred in the last 4,000 years that exactly. we're aware of. <laughs> and how fast it happened and you know yeah. all this kind of stuff. So um, yeah. I thought that was very interesting that it really hasn't changed that much over 4,000 years, despite these fluctuations. And again, that probably has to do with being a general predator. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, there was one on sleep in 2012. And I, I, some of these I just picked out because I'm like, well, that's just interesting and odd, not necessarily new. Um, but these were, they were looking at sleep. Um, and what's interesting is that the pattern of sleep when they're on land is similar to the odorated seals, the sea lions. Um, but patterns of sleep when they're in water are similar to the faucets, so the true hmm. So they're kind of like this link between the two, where they sleep like That's sea cool. lions on land, but sleep like seals in water. Which interesting. I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, let's see. Okay, so this one has to do with those uh, stampedes. So this is from 2013, um, and they were looking at the population level effects of increased mortality for, of calves due to disturbance, like we talked about. So they did these projections, um, I won't get into uh, details, but um, basically they said that the increased mortality from disturbance events when they panic and stampede and crush all the babies um, of only calves has a greater effect than an equivalent increase in harvest related mortality distributed all among the age classes. Wow. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting. Like it doesn't matter, like you could have a, a bigger increase in killing a whole bunch of them as, as across all age classes but these disturbance events would have a bigger impact on population. Which makes sense because you're taking yep. out one specific subset that is the next generation. And like mm -hmm. you said, with having those longer reproductive yeah. cycles. Yeah, wow. you got to wait, then she's got to be next year and then it's you know, all the 15 months and then it's another two years. So you have like at least three or four years before you then replace those calves. 
recruitment you know? is going to be really, yeah. really low. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. So that, I mean, that goes again to the climate change, how much that is more of an issue for these guys than anything else kind of indirectly, you know, not mm -hmm. directly dying because of it. Um, so then uh, in 2010, they were again trying to find how do we, how do we uh, count these guys without being in the Arctic or Antarctic or whatever. Um, they actually used thermal imagery. Mm -hmm. So um, because they're warmer than the ice or snow or seawater that's behind them, it was very, a very good way to do it. So you can use thermal sensors and cover as much as four times the area per hour of flight time. Um, with wow. greater reliability than visual. So instead of being in a plane and counting, you just like have the thermal imagery and then you can do a lot more. So um, interestingly, I didn't see that many other papers after that that have used it, but again, I didn't do an extensive search. So <laughs> um, there was uh, one in 1999 that reviewed uh, basically why it's hard to research these guys <laughs> and what they should do. And they said the problems with past surveys include Walruses could have moved between land haulouts and nearby sea ice in the Western Chichki Sea during the course of a survey. Walrus groups on the sea ice, numbering up to several thousands, were difficult to count with accuracy, weather, and lack of aircraft, restricted timing, and location of sampling efforts. So it's hard. Um, so this by recommended that they incorporate deployment and monitoring of satellite transmitters um, and replicated counts on both the sea ice and land haulouts. So you can correlate like how many are maybe counted twice or not. Um, data for all surveys should be averaged and then corrected for the average fraction of observations of walrus available to be counted. So again, the, the, basically the past counts have not been very statistically uh, correct. Sound. <laughs> yeah, like they, they haven't said like, hey, these are the biases or this is the, um, mm. stand, the what's the, the error bars. <sighs> yeah, standard, is. like standard error. Yeah, exactly. So they didn't really do that very well. So um, hopefully that's improved, but. Um, so this one was cool. I have two more. Um, this one was cool because this is talking again about the citizen science. So, you know, walruses from space kind of thing, but different. Um, and using uh, indigenous people as a, re a resource for information. And we talked about this on another podcast about how indigenous people have, you know, they know everything about these walruses because they live with them and from and because of them for you know hundreds of years mm -hmm. so using that knowledge would really really helpful so they have a Bering sea sub network a community-based observation network that was initiated to improve knowledge of environmental changes occurring in the Bering sea and enable scientists arctic communities and governments in to predict plan and respond so they show that um uh, harvest the harvesters are perceptive of um and often have multi-generational knowledge about the environmental conditions which um, the substance, subs, subs, subsist subsistence, there we go, subsistence, thank you. <laughs> Good Lord, I cannot read that. Uh, activities are dependent upon. So they know when the, the years go up or down and, and you know what's going on with these animals. Um, and so they were utilizing community monitoring from these people with this knowledge that can detect these local level environmental changes and provide society with examples of adaptation strategies. So being able to utilize this uh, information that these people have for the last hundreds of years can help us in conserving the species for them and for the, the animals themselves and for the greater greater good. So I just think that was really important in utilizing all the knowledge that we have and not being like, oh, you harvest them and you're terrible and that's awful, whatever. You're like, no, like you can do it sustainably and you can use the knowledge that they have to be able to benefit the animals mm -hmm. and work to work together, right? <clears throat> um, and then, oh, and so this one is the only one I have from the Atlantic. This is actually in 2020. Um, and they showed that there was a latitudinal differences. So where you are higher up in the um, area or lower in the area on the world, um, again, using these stable isotopes. So that was apparently a very common thing as well. They're <laughs> doing walrus research through stable isotopes. <laughs> um, but there was an 18% sea ice decline in the mid-Arctic and the, the sea ice derived carbon that the walruses were, were um, intaking from their food decreased by 75%, wow. suggesting a strong decoupling of the sea ice and the benthic habitat. So the loss of the sea ice greatly changed what the animals were eating. In, in the, the Atlantic. Atlantic. In the Atlantic, but in, that's in the mid-Arctic. By contrast, mm. a nearly exclusive amount of sea ice derived carbon was maintained in the high Arctic, 98% and 89% in two different years. 
mm. despite a similar percentage in sea ice reduction. So the farther north you were, the less your diet changed, even though the sea ice changed was the same in both areas. How interesting. Yeah. So it's, again, it's not that blanket thing, like the, the sea ice or this change is affecting all of the Atlantic walruses the same. Mm -hmm. Whoever's utilizing these different habitats might have a different, you know, success rate. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so these, they indicate that the, these latitudinal differences, um, that they're, uh, the, the change in Arctic marine ecosystem functioning between sea ice, pelagic, and benthic habitats is, is complex, right? It's not that all the same. Um, so I thought that was very interesting, especially since the Atlantic has had a, a greater sea ice reduction than the Pacific. Mm -hmm. and then how that relates to their food so yeah um so that's again mainly they're looking at so it's happening what's happening with climate change <laughs> which makes sense i mean yeah. that's it yeah is. logical yeah i mean that's it, you if you're gonna trying to protect something you're gonna look at the most clear and present danger and for them that's what this is in direct mm -hmm. and indirect ways yeah um okay so what other fun facts besides the fact that yeah the, let's finish up with some fun facts <laughs> yeah i know right <laughs> So walruses can live up to 40 years, mm -hmm. um, just for reference. And Latin names, let's get into the naming because, you know, it's always the most fun part. So the Latin name for the walrus just generally is Odobenus rosmarus, um, which means a tooth walking seahorse, which I'm like that, right? Like that right there, that is the coolest Latin name I think I've ever heard. Right. I'm like, yes, done. And so one thing I wanted to note on there is that you're talking about a horse and, and many of the, the names go back to that. And what I think is interesting is that their teeth, their tusks grow throughout their lives. And so do horses' teeth. Yeah. That's where the yep. long and the long and the tooth thing comes from because mm -hmm. horses' teeth go. So it, it it totally makes sense that they're like this giant seahorse. Well, and what's interesting is the they, they don't really know specifically what the root of the, the common name walrus actually came from, but they think that it might have originated from the old war, old Norse word. Uh, Hrosval, meaning horse whale. So again, interesting that they're tying in the horse thing, which I find really fascinating. Like, where was this association with horses coming right, from? They don't, they don't look like horses. They don't look like horses. I, so I, I find that fascinating. They knew that the teeth and horses and the teeth and yeah. <laughs> so it's super interesting. Like. Yeah. But yeah, so that was that was super cool, just with their with their Latin name. Um, and then the the only other one that I had was just about just a little more expansion on their vocalizations. So mm -hmm. they are one of the most vocal pinniped species. So like Cindy said, they will use these bell-like sounds underwater when they're what, during the mating area mm -hmm. um, or mating season rather. But they also have been recorded to make grunts, snorts, bellows, growls, barks, whistles, rasps, and clicks. Um, oh, it's a lot. And so some of them are made using the vocal cords, but a lot of them, especially the bell sounds, are actually made using air sacs that extend from their pharynx. Um, oh. And they have they have actually documented some stereotype sequences during the mating displays. So they're like is, cetaceans too? Like they have like little right? air sacs that they're doing these? Right? What? I know. And also, so just for anyone who's not an acoustics nerd like, like me, the, the stereotype sequences are basically they're they're using the same phrase. So if you yeah. have to like use it like a song like that has a repeating chorus. Like baby they're shark. Using the, I hear that right? <laughs> sure. Um they're using the same the same like phrasing um mm. sequence during mating sequences that has been reported. So, so they're almost like singing to the to Right. The so and I, I didn't really see a ton more information on it, but they yeah, they they are at least repeating themselves a little bit which is really interesting oh, interesting mm -hmm. and i i mean i've only i've only gotten to see a walrus like i hate to say it but like at sea world and, and aquarium they have yeah. and i you know you hear them they do um they're usually i seem really like growl like you would think it'd be a big like they, yeah yeah so I, I feel like some of these sounds that they make like these bells it's like when you see hear a, a bald eagle <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> right? like, like did that did that bird make that sound eagle. weird uh, that's crazy. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so my one is uh, linked to cultural uh, references in uh, like indigenous um, um, things. And it says uh, both in Chukotka and Alaska, the Aurora Borealis is believed to be a special world inhabited by those who died by violence. The changing rays representing deceased souls playing ball with a walrus head. Oh my God. <laughs> So right? the Aurora Borealis is the Northern Lights for yes. those of you who don't aren't familiar with that term. But oh my gosh, right? And so there was wow. a, there was there was more in that, but there was like a whole story. I'm like, okay, we can't go all the way through that. There's other origins of you know what these beliefs are about what happens. But 
yeah I thought I was like oh. that is fascinating I was reading it I'm like well where does the walrus oh the walrus comes in because they're playing ball with its head <laughs> Which seems like not a great idea because they're they have giant tusks. So, but you know, maybe they if they're already deceased, they don't they don't need. Right. Don't well, that's true. Worry about yeah, it. They can be impaled again. <laughs> How weird. fascinating! Yeah. So I thought those were like, because and one thing to be said is is in the indigenous cultures as we've already talked about with their um, cultural use and for their food use and stuff that is a big part of their of their culture. And so yeah. you're going to have these you know uh, these myths and ideas about what different things are and, and how they relate to your to your culture so mm -hmm. I thought that, that was is super cool yeah so walruses are very very cool <laughs> in many different ways um but I think that's it that's all your fun facts right mm -hmm. yep, that's it. um I think there were quite a few just fun facts within the whole thing that we did because there's just so these guys are incredible things. yeah um and it's just so interesting what um I'm excited to see what else we can learn about this because because I feel like they have more secrets in store um which is really cool um, so that's it. Uh, next episode will likely be a journal review. Um, so again, if you have anything of interest, although we do have one picked out, one that just came out, and both Kat and I, I emailed her and I was like, oh, this one just came out. I think we should do this one next. And she's like, I just downloaded it too. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. So um, we're excited about that one for the next episode, uh, but we won't tell you what it is yet. Um, and don't forget to go to our website for uh, merch. Again, we're going to have some new merch up hopefully in the next few months. Um, but we do have some stuff up there now that you can get and cute stuffed animals and all the proceeds go directly back to our research and being able to give you this uh, kind of information as well on our podcast and educational stuff on YouTube. Um, so be sure to check us out on social media, Facebook and Instagram and our YouTube channel. And we look forward to chatting to you in a couple of weeks about this really cool new paper we found. So we will see you then. Bye. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P A C M A M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks.